Okay, welcome to A and P one. Uh, this is chapter one, uh, and this is pretty much an overview of anatomy and physiology. So we'll look at the um, eleven systems in this chapter, just as a quick overview, um, sort of like a catch-all for everything uh, to introduce you to the course, and then we'll define some terms. One of the important things that is part of this chapter is the directional terms. Directional terms are terms that are used to describe positions of structures within the human body. Uh, you do need to memorize this list of terms. You need to know these because when you read a question on a test, it's going to be described in these terms. Uh, you know, I could ask you, you know, what structure is dorsal to uh, the tibia, you know, and you'd have to be able to know what dorsal means. Um, so when we get to those terms, make sure that you are familiar with them. So starting off, uh, let's talk about anatomy. Anatomy is the study of structures. Uh, and this can be broken down into either gross or macroscopic, which is what pretty much what you can see with the naked eye. Uh, microscopic anatomy, this requires a microscope. Uh, this would be cytology looking at cells or histology looking at tissues, uh, both of which we'll be doing early on in this course. And then developmental anatomy is essentially embryology, but it is also the development of the human body throughout life as well. So to study anatomy, uh, you need to master anatomical terminology. Uh, there's gonna be a lot of terms and a lot of structures, uh, and that is pretty much straight up memorization. Uh, you need to be able to uh, get that information in. Um, unfortunately, you know, in some of these courses, time is tight. Uh, especially if this is an accelerated course um, over seven weeks and not a full 15-week semester, you really don't have time and you really need to start working on this as soon as possible. Observation is important. Make sure you look as many images as you possibly can and as many views as you can. Manipulation. Look at these structures in the lab. You know, when we do the bones, look at the actual bones, look at them either articulated in the full skeleton and look at them disarticulated in the boxes. Palpitation, this is actually feeling these structures and looking for these structures. Uh, and oscillation is actually listening, you know, for example, like a heartbeat, things like that, blood flow. Uh, that's more AMP2 than AMP1. Now, physiology, this is the study of the function of the human body. Uh, this is how things work, and this does require a little bit more than memorization. This requires you to actually understand processes that are occurring. The best for this is to read the chapters in the book and look at the little uh, flow diagrams that are in the book that take you through processes. Um, it is not good enough to just memorize structures. You also have to be able to understand how those structures function. And this gets down to really putting some time in with the material to understand how these things operate. Now the subdivisions are based on the organ systems for physiology. Often we'll focus on the cellular and molecular level because this is where a lot of these functions are occurring and also the body's abilities to depend on chemical reactions in the individual cells. Now to study physiology, you have to have the ability to focus at many levels from systemic to cellular and molecular. You know, first of all, you need to know the basics. That's gonna be the molecular. Then how does this operate in the cell and which cells are involved and what are their functions and what are they doing? But then you need to think about it as a system and even then as a whole organism. You know, when we talk about, for example, a skeletal muscle contraction, okay, we're going to talk about how an individual muscle contracts. But then you need to take a step back and think about how does this actually affect the overall organism of the human being? And does this affect any other systems of the body if there's either use of this particular structure or if there is overuse of this structure or, you know, what's going to be the demand on the body itself? Uh, physiology is the study of basic physical principles, such as electrical currents, pressures, and movements, and the study of basic chemical principles as well. Now, anatomy and physiology are inseparable. They function always to reflect a structure. 
and what a structure can do depends on its specific form. So let's look at the overall level of structural organization in the human body or any, any organism per se. You have the chemical level. This is the atoms and molecules, and this will be covered in chapter two, which is also part of this week. You'll then look at the organelles, which are going to be part of the cells, the subcellular structures of the eukaryotic cells that we find as humans. This will be covered as in chapter three. Now, chapter three and chapter two should be um, somewhat review material from your bio, gen bio course that you took. Both of these chapters were covered, and it is assumed that you know this material coming into 109. Uh, and we are just kind of reviewing it at this point to make sure that you have not forgotten anything. When we look at the cellular level, again, chapter three, this is going over the cells, uh, the eukaryotic cells that make up a human being. Then we'll get into tissues, which will be chapter four. And then you have a bunch of tissues that will make up organs, a bunch of organs that'll make up an organ system, and then a bunch of organ systems that make up the organism as a whole. And here's a little schematic that kind of goes through that uh, levels of structural organization here, okay? Now, there are some necessary life functions, such as maintaining boundaries, movement, responsiveness, digestion, metabolism, disposal of waste, reproduction, and growth. When we talk about maintaining boundaries, this is between internal and external environments. For example, plasma membranes, which separate the inside of a cell from the outside of a cell, as well as skin, which separates the outside of the body from the inside of the body. Movement, this is contractility. This is of body parts, which is going to involve your skeletal muscles. This is physical movement, like walking across the room, or of substances, such as moving substances around the body. This will include cardiac and smooth muscles, which are more internal structures. Um, responsiveness, this is the ability to sense and respond to stimuli, mm -hmm. also to withdrawal reflex such as if you put your hand on a hot stove, you remove it, as well as control of breathing rate. Digestion, this is the breakdown of ingested foodstuffs and the absorption of simple molecules into the blood. Metabolism, this is going to be all chemical reactions that occur in the body cells and will include catabolic and anabolic reactions. Excretion is the removal of waste from metabolism and digestion, and it involves urea, carbon dioxide, and feces. Reproduction, this is a cellular division for growth or repair, as well as the production of offspring. And then growth is an increase in size of a body part or an organism. Now, humans are multicellular organisms. You're actually made up of approximately 10 trillion human cells. To function, we must keep individual cells alive. All cells depend on organ systems to meet their survival needs, and all body functions spread among different organ systems. The organ systems cooperate to maintain life. And there are 11... Um, organ systems in the body, and these are described in figure 1.3. We also see interrelationships among the body organ systems. For example, the respiratory system brings in oxygen and removes carbon dioxide. The circulatory system transports that oxygen and carbon dioxide throughout the body. The digestive system brings in food and nutrients into the bloodstream, which then transfers it throughout the body, and any waste products end up getting removed by the GI tract and the urinary tract. So point being is most of these systems are going to be interconnected with each other. And you'll notice that if you have a pathology or an issue in one system, that can definitely affect other systems. Sort of creates what we call a snowball effect. So let's look at the different organ systems. Uh, the first is going to be the integumentary system. This forms the external body coverings and protects deeper tissues from injury. 
The skin is also going to be the site of vitamin D synthesis, and it houses cutaneous uh, receptors such as pain and pressure, as well as your sweat and oil glands. The skeletal system protects and supports the body organs, and it provides a framework that muscles will use to cause movement. Blood cells are found within the bone marrow, within bones, and bones will also store minerals, most importantly, calcium, which is a major signaling molecule that's used for the human body. The muscular system, this is primarily your skeletal muscles, allows for manipulation in the environment, locomotion, and facial expression. It helps to maintain posture and it also produces heat. The nervous system, this is a fast acting control system of the body. It responds to internal and external changes by activating appropriate muscles and glands. The endocrine system, this is going to contain glands that secrete hormones that regulate processes such as growth, reproduction, and nutrient use, such as metabolism, by body cells. The cardiovascular system, this is going to include your blood vessels that transport blood, which will carry oxygen, carbon dioxide, nutrients, waste, as well as the heart, which is a form of muscle called cardiac muscle, which is responsible for actually pumping the blood through the whole cardiovascular system. The lymphatic system and immune systems, this lymphatic system will pick up fluid leaked from the blood vessels, and it actually returns it back to the blood vessels. It also disposes of debris in the lymphatic stream. It houses white blood cells, which are lymphocytes and play an important role in your overall immunity. The immune system, immune system response will mount the attack against foreign substances uh, within the body as well. The respiratory system keeps blood constantly supplied with oxygen and it helps to remove carbon dioxide, which is a waste product of cellular respiration. The gaseous exchange occurs through the walls of the air sacs, which are called alveoli within the lung. The digestive system, this will break down food and absorb break down food into what we call absorbable units that will then be able to be entered into the bloodstream uh, and to distributed from the bloodstream to most body cells. Indigestible foodstuffs are eliminated as feces. The urinary system, this will eliminate nitrogenous waste from the body. It also helps to regulate electrolyte and acid-based balance of the blood. And then finally, the reproductive system. Uh, for the male, the overall function is the production of offspring for both systems. Uh, the testes will produce sperm and the male sex hormone, and the male ducts and glands aid in delivery of sperm to the female reproductive tract. The ovaries will produce eggs and female sex hormones. The remaining female structures serve as sites for fertilization and the development of the fetus. Mammary glands of the female breast will also produce milk to nourish the newborn. And those are the 11 systems. Um, you should know generally the 11 systems and what their main functions are. Um, you know, I would be surprised if I saw a matching section on your first exam asking you those things. Um, I wouldn't go too crazy with this because obviously there's going to be a chapter that follows up with each of these systems uh, in the near future here. Okay, now as a human, there are certain survival needs that are needed, and these are appropriate amounts necessary for life. Uh, too little or too much can actually be harmful. This will include things such as nutrients, oxygen, water, maintaining a normal body temperature, which is 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, or 37 degrees Celsius, as well as appropriate atmospheric pressure. This is the pressure that the atmosphere places on the body on, on us living on this planet. Um, atmospheric pressure is actually uh, something that's at sea level. 
So looking at nutrients, these are the chemicals for energy and cell building. Uh, these will include your carbohydrates, your fats, proteins, minerals, vitamins, things like that. Oxygen, this is essential for energy release in ATP production. In bio, you should have covered uh, cellular respiration, uh, which is the process of glycolysis, the citric acid cycle, and the electron transport chain. Uh, and this is why cells need oxygen to be able to undergo those processes. You do need to know those processes a little bit later on in the course. Uh, water, this is the most abundant chemical in the body. Uh, it is the environment of chemical reactions. Um, it is also a fluid base for secretions and excretions. Uh, maintenance of normal body temperature, as I said, it's 37 degrees Celsius, and this helps to affect the rate of chemical reactions. And then appropriate atmospheric pressure, this is for adequate breathing and gas exchange within the lungs. Now, homeostasis is a term that's used for maintenance of relatively stable internal conditions despite continuous changes in the environment. It is a dynamic state of equilibrium and it's maintained by contributions of all organ systems. Homeostatic control mechanisms are going to involve the continuous monitoring and regulation of all factors that can change what, what we are going to refer to as variables. Communication is necessary for monitoring and regulation. And this is going to involve heavily with the nervous and the endocrine systems. The nervous and endocrine systems will accomplish communication by nerve impulses, but also with the endocrine system, you're secreting hormones, which are chemical messengers that are also going to help with communication. When we look at a control mechanism, you're gonna have some type of receptor, which is the sensory portion. This is going to monitor the environment. It's also potentially going to respond to some type of stimuli. That could be light. It could be pressure. It could be pain. It could be a chemical. Mm. That receptor is going to send sensory information to the control center. The control center is the determined set point at which the variable is maintained. It will also receive input from the receptor and it will determine an appropriate response. Most likely your control center is going to be your central nervous system, which is the brain and spinal cord. The brain and spinal cord will come up with a response and that's going to involve what we refer to as the effector. This receives the output from the control center. It also provides the means to respond and the response either reduces which is what we refer to as a negative feedback, or enhances the stimulus, which is what we refer to as positive feedback. And the goal here for homeostasis is you're going to eventually end up out of balance, and the goal is to, for the body to bring it back into normal ranges. I'll give you a quick little example here. If you eat a meal, your blood glucose levels go back up. You, the, your blood glucose levels rise. As a result, your body will secrete insulin, which will then bring the blood glucose levels back down. As your blood level, glucose levels come back to normal, you will stop secreting insulin. So the fact that you came back to the normal range and then stopped the, the response, which was the secretion of insulin, that is actually what we refer to as a negative feedback mechanism. The negative feedback, this is the most common feedback mechanism that is used to maintain homeostasis. 99% uh, of the time, it's going to be negative feedback. Uh, you have response which reduces or shuts off the original stimulus. For example, the original stimulus was the um, elevated blood glucose levels, but because we secreted the insulin, the blood glucose levels came back to normal range that shuts off the secretion of the insulin. Okay. Um, you know, here's another example of regulation of blood volume by antidiuretic hormone or ADH. Um, you can sort of read through this one. Uh, positive feedback. This is the response enhances or exaggerates the original stimulus. This may be a cascade or amplifying event, and it usually controls infrequent events that do not require continuous adjustment. 
Uh, there's only, I think, three that I could think of off the top of my head that are positive feedback. And that is, uh, one of them is going to be labor contractions. So if you know anything about labor contractions, you have labor contractions. What happens with them is they get more and more intense. And they get more and more intense because that is the positive feedback stimulus. It's essentially a snowball effect. When you take you know, a snowball and you keep uh, rolling it through the snow, it's going to keep getting greater and greater and greater. Now, the only thing that can actually turn off a positive feedback is an intervening event. And in the case with labor, the intervening event is going to be birth of the newborn. That will stop labor. Uh, another example is blood clotting. Uh, that would be another positive feedback mechanism. Now, it is very important that you maintain homeostasis. If you do not maintain homeostasis, this can lead to disturbances, um, which can lead to increase in risk for disease. It can also contribute to changes associated with aging, control systems less efficient. And if negative feedback systems are overwhelmed, this could be destructive. Positive feedback mechanisms might actually eventually take over. Um, we'll get a little bit more into this in AMP2. Okay, now, now we're going to talk about anatomical terms and specifically anatomical position. And this is also going to be the first lab exercise, which isn't really a lab. It's really you filling out uh, some worksheets um, going over these anatomical terms. So you're going to be hit with these. Uh, remember that you need to be able to know these terms, okay, early on. Um, anatomical position is when you have uh, the body erect feet slightly apart, and palms facing forward, meaning your thumbs are pointing away from the body. You, you can assume that any image is given to you in anatomical position unless otherwise noted. You always use directional terms as if the body is in anatomical position. Right and left refer to the body being viewed, not those of the observer. So there are different regions that are used, and you might know some of these just by their names. Uh, you know, you have the frontal, which is the forehead, orbital, which is eye, oral, which is mouth, sternal, which is chest, um, you know, pubic, which would be genital area. Um, so you want to familiarize yourselves with these areas of the body. Okay. And generally, like if you saw that term, you should know that, you know, for example, carpal, that's going to be in the wrist region. Okay. So let's look at these directional terms here. Um, superior, this is towards the head end or upper part of the structure of the body. Okay. So for example, the head is superior, meaning it's towards the upper part of the body to the abdomen, which is lower. Inferior is away from the head end or towards the lower part of the body of a structure. Ventral or anterior is going to be towards the front of the body or in front of. Dorsal or posterior is towards the back of the body or behind. The anterior side would be the front side. The posterior side would be the back side. If you're referring to a structure that is towards the front, you would say ventral. If you're referring to a structure that's towards the back, you would say dorsal. Medial is going to be towards the midline. Lateral is going to be away from the midline. And intermediate would be between medial and lateral. Uh, you know, if you're talking about three structures, uh, one of those structures might be intermediate to the other two. Proximal, this is closer to the origin of the body, meaning closer to the trunk. Distal is further away from the origin of the body, again, referring to the trunk. Superficial is going to be on the surface, anything like on the surface of the skin. Uh, and deep is going to be anything deeper, you know, deep into the 
tissue deep into the skin. Um, you know, like muscle is going to be deep to the skin. There are also some regional terms. There are two major divisions of the body. Axial includes the head, neck, and trunk. And then the appendicular, which is, you know, think about the word after there, appendicular. Think of appendages. Appendages are your limbs. Uh, the regional terms will designate specific areas within the body divisions. And again, these are the regional terms that we saw a few minutes ago. Here's the posterior side. So this is the front side. This is what we refer to as the anterior view. Here's the back side. This is the posterior view. And again, you can see some more of these regional terms there. Now, humans differ externally and internally. 90% of structures present in the body match the description of the textbook. So this is like a little disclaimer here that, you know, we might tell you something is somewhere, but in reality, eh, might be somewhat variable in its location. Uh, this is very common for nerve and blood vessels may be out of place and small muscles might be missing or, again, in a different location. Uh, any extreme variations might end up being inconsistent with life. All right. Body planes, these are flat surface along which the body or structure may be cut for anatomical study. And a section is a cut or sections are made along body planes. So there are three most common. Sagittal plane is going to divide the body vertically into right and left parts. It produces a sagittal section if cut along this plane. Mid-sagittal will be directly down the midline. Parasagittal is not on the midline. It could be a little to the left, a little to the right. But it is still going vertically to split the body into right and left parts. <clears throat> Frontal or coronal plane, this divides the body vertically into anterior and posterior parts. Transverse, this is a horizontal cut. This would divide the body horizontally, which is 90 degrees to the vertical planes, and this will help to produce a cross-section. Um, oblique, this is um, any cuts or angles at are other than a 90 degree angle. So here you can see these different uh, planes. Uh, here we have the uh, sagittal transverse going this direction. Okay. And then this one is the frontal plane. Uh, this is actually uh, separating, you know, anterior from posterior. Uh, the body also has a few cavities. There are two sets of internal body cavities. These are closed to the environment. They provide different degrees of protection to the organs. We have the dorsal body cavity and the ventral body cavity. The dorsal body cavity protects the nervous system. There are two subdivisions of this. You have the cranial cavity, which encases the brain, and the vertebral cavity, which encloses the spinal cord. And here you can see uh, the cranial cavity right here and then the vertebral cavity right here. Okay, so here you can see the cranial cavity, and then this will be the vertebral cavity. And again, this makes up the dorsal body cavity. The ventral body cavity, this is going to house all of your internal organs, or what we refer to as viscera. There are two subdivisions. They are separated by a diaphragm. You have the thoracic cavity, and then the abdominal pelvic cavity. The thoracic cavity subdivisions would include the two pleural cavities. Each pleural cavity will house a lung. The mediastinum is going to contain the pericardial cavity, and this surrounds the thoracic organs. And then the pericardial cavity will enclose the heart. The abdominal pelvic cavity subdivisions, you have the abdominal cavity, which contains the stomach, intestine, spleen, and liver. And then the pelvic cavity, which contains the urinary bladder, reproductive organs, and the rectum. And again, you, you can see the uh, ventral body cavities where we have the pleural for each lung, superior and superior mediastinum, and then the pericardial cavity 
this is all part of the thoracic cavity. And then you have the abdominal pelvic cavities here for the abdominal pelvic region. Um, serous membranes or serosa. These are thin, double-layered membranes. You have the parietal serosa, which will line internal body cavity walls, and the visceral serosa, which covers the internal organs. So if you picture the heart, the visceral serosa is going to cover the actual heart itself. The parietal layer or serosa is going to cover the wall of the pericardial cavity. And then what you're going to have is fluid between those two layers of serosa. What this does is as the heart contracts, it creates a friction-free environment so that you don't have the heart muscle rubbing up against the wall of the cavity. And this, this is something that's very common for most of your internal organs. So you'll see these layers uh, for most of these structures. Okay, so for example, you can see that right here where the visceral layer, this blue line right here is lining the heart. The parietal layer is lining the cavity. And then you would have fluid in this space so that it creates a friction-free environment. And that's it. Like I said, make sure you kind of, for this chapter, you know, overview the 11 systems. Know what homeostasis is, specifically negative feedback regulatory mechanisms. And then make sure you know those directional terms, body cavities, things like that, and areas of the body. And you should be good. Uh, the first lab exercise, like I said, this is going to pretty much be worksheets that you'll be working on. Um, talk about those in the first lab. Uh, they are going to uh, essentially take you through a lot of these things again. Okay. That is it.